So, thank you once again for this very special uh, invitation to talk about my own practices. Uh, it is not something uh, that comes very naturally to me and I am probably doing it for the first time in the sense of looking at all the various uh, things that interest me. Uh, Ranjit, when he invited me to do this, basically asked me to kind of, you know, like Dr. Sheldon Cooper talks about making a unified theory of myself. And I can tell you this, that if I try to do it, it's going to go down very badly. So with that in mind, I thought I may just begin. Uh, like I said, it's, it's very difficult to kind of describe oneself in, uh, in, in a sense. So I will probably just do that by doing a series of readings and so on. But uh, if I have to be totally honest, I think the way I would like to talk about myself is, do you, have you heard of the stereotype of the magpie? Okay, the magpie is essentially a, a bird which is always attracted by shiny objects and goes there and steals something in the other and kind of puts it together to form a nest. That is more or less a reasonable description of what I do. Uh, so I thought that I can get that over with in the first place by reading a poem uh, which I wrote some time back which is in a sense a kind of metaph metaphorical way of looking at the various practices that I have. Uh, this is a poem from my second book of uh, English poetry called, the book is called Cosmopolitician and the poem is called Pots. Pots. There is something in me that makes me draw pots. Over and over I shape them on complementary jotting pads of ruled paper, flotsam of symposia. I put down the mouth first, the body comes later, governed by the available space on a page and the spanner of my attention. Until completed by the caresses of fountain pen, I have no inkling whether they will turn out to be saucers, amphora, or ghatams. Have I filled them to the brim with my excesses? I know I never did tilt them to see what pours out, alembic, elixir, or earth-cooled water, sitting sweet as in a matka, my mother would dip a copper cup hand first to sake my thirst. My pots tend to the bulbous, seldom taper like a vase or a test tube. They are but lines, and yet I have a sense that if struck, they would ring quite satisfactorily. <clears throat> so one kind of pursues a variety of interests, and in most cases, things work out, things are uh, satisfactory, things give delight to the soul, uh, and so on. So if I have to kind of make a strand that runs through the various practices and kind of doing it in a slightly forced manner over here, I thought I would talk essentially about the city, because that is a good way that can encompass uh, the practices and the lives of a citizen, an architect, a teacher, a poet, and so on. And in the various writings that I have done, in the various ways I have dealt with the city, its history, uh, its archives are probably the basis for, uh, or they inform a lot of the other things that happen. So I begin by looking at myself pretty simply as, you know, a body on the street. And the first description, if at all, is that of a citizen. And my memories as a, from very early childhood also are more about the things that we saw in Bombay 
you know, by just walking. Uh, being located very interestingly and luckily, shall we say, right in the heart of South Bombay, these are the things that became the initial kind of impressions. And the idea of being on the street and the things that come at you from the street probably have had greater influence on me on all the other things that I have done than I can probably imagine. So uh, one of the important things that we see when we look at this notion of the past and try to imagine the future is the constantly changing landscape, as I'm sure you're all aware. Uh, anyone who has lived in Bombay for an extended period of time knows that the ground beneath the feet is constantly shifting. Uh, if you are as old as I am, you have been seeing it shift for a very, very long time. And very interestingly, uh, I probably have seen places which have been replaced, which in your imagination is only the replaced place, you know, something like that. So uh, I have been lucky to, uh, as Ranjit mentioned, to write this column for Time Out and a few other publications. So I thought I would read you some excerpts from a few pieces, uh, which would probably also help to take these notions forward. Uh, this is a piece which I want to read from a column I wrote in 2012, uh, and it is called Radio Days. Uh, and this is uh, uh, interesting because at that time in 2012, uh, are you all aware of Manish Market? Okay, yeah, Manish Market had caught fire not once but twice. So this is essentially a story about that, okay? Okay, I, I propose of nothing, here are some images, okay? Uh, they are just a little link kind of things for this presentation. Uh, this is uh, Radio Days, <clears throat> Manish Market, near Crawford Market, caught fire earlier this year. This ignited some smoldering embers at the back of my mind, and then the market caught fire once again, and unlocked the memory of a lurid poster of Bhut Bangla. Several skeletons with glowing eye sockets danced the twist, while an image of Tanuja screaming over was painted, over her image was painted the titles in chiseled impressionistic strokes. The poster quite affected the five-year-old that I was at that time. My uncle, whose finger I tightly held on to, had to drag me away from this phantasmagoric tableau. I would conjure up ghosts in every corner for a while after that. We were walking outside the radio talkies on Paltan Road. This was the late 60s. In 1974, to my chagrin, Radio Talkies was pulled down and Manish Market came up in its place. Manish Market, as you are aware, is Bombay's bastion or used to be Bombay's bastion of what we call smuggling goods, especially of Sony and National Panasonic made in Japan televisions. Uh, the loss of Radio Talkies uh, was severe for me, not only because this was a cinema a theater within the walking distance that a child was allowed to go, but also because it was special being a purveyor of rerunning Hindi films, which changed every day. This was unusual probably even at that time. Growing up in the 70s, cinema houses were the horn of plenty from which we partook, not by watching the films necessarily, but by devouring their posters. We would stand open-mouthed like guppies in front of each new shoveling, daring-do action, grand Guignol melodrama, and color by Technicolor, Ravi Varma channelized heroines into our subconscious wholesale. And we could find a new one every day. Radio cinema also offered another urban pleasure, rare even for those times. It was a modest one-story building set back into a large compound, bounded by low walls and a gate, always open. 
The other grounds I recall with warmth and sadness is the former West End on Pune's main street, and that is an image of Pune's West End. Radio looked something like this at the time. You could walk right up to the booking office with impunity and gaze at the placards of the next change uh, version. The grounds of the radio always exuded an odor of cigarette smoke, because at that time everybody smoked, and fish. The Crawford Market sold meat, but you had to cross the road to the shed next to the cinema, abutting the Pulton Road police chowky, to buy everything from fresh paplet to dry Colby soda. When the radio talkies was consigned to memory, so were its grounds. The old fish market soon followed. Manish market would be built right on the road, denying even a reasonable footpath outside it. The Bombay of my childhood used to be an accommodating sponge. Mumbai today is its fossilized after avatar, solidified, rocky, and unyielding. Radio cinema lives on in its name in its cousin around the corner, the Radio Hotel. And this is an image of the Radio Hotel. This is open even today. A true city survivor, a hotel in a standalone erstwhile warehouse that has its former owner's name, Akbar Ali Mullah Rasulji, engraved in Gujarati, above an entrance so big you can drive a truck through it. Its whitewashed stucco facade is in the Baroque style, with a centrally ornamented window typical of mid-19th century Bora architecture. The Radio Hotel's interior volume is certainly the largest in the city, with a vast open floor and a ceiling that rises more than 20 feet. The hotel has, of course, seen better days, but still offers an Irani menu, one of the last surviving places where you can order goat's kidneys for breakfast. Consider this, the radio hotel, the Musafir Khana next doors, the Palton Road police chowki, the Pedru Shah Darga, and the Crawford Market, all survived the Fort Stikin blast on the Bombay docks in 1944 that devastated so many buildings that were just adjacent to them. These places and artifacts will go, no doubt, in time, but let us at least pay them the respect of memory giving them a last hurrah. Uh, this I wrote in 2012, and in a sense, this has been a running stream. It begins with a location in a kind of nostalgia for the past, you know, looking back and saying, okay, you know, it was so nice when we were children, that sort of thing. But as you grow, you tend to see that the, the, the space around you is constantly shifting, and what you find yourself as rooted, or those things that rooted you, gave you memory, are being uprooted in a way that leaves you pretty untethered, isn't it? And we have to then find ways to deal with uh, these, these, these things again. Uh, <clears throat> I started architecture school in the early 1980s, and uh, I joined the Sir J. J. College of Architecture, and which is where I got my basic education as an architect. Uh, this was an interesting time because it was a time of uh, pretty resolute modernism, in the sense that there was this great insistence on the universal, and there was this great insistence on the original. So you never look back to the past. History was considered something that you would not normally refer to because you, you, you dealt with what was current, the new technologies, the new materials, the new ways of building, the new necessities of your own time, and original and different ways of doing so. Uh, in our time, there was very little discussion about this, whether there was an alternative to this at all. So much so that we believed that what we existed in was absolute. You know, the modernism that we learned to, uh, to design was the only thing. Uh, it took a very long time, 
and I will also suggest a career in teaching to understand uh, that that was not the only way to look at, uh, at things. Around the time that uh, after I graduated, uh, I was incredibly privileged uh, to work uh, for a very idiosyncratic architect uh, who hasn't really been talked about enough, whose name was Chandrakan Patel. And he was the architect who designed the stock exchange building, which is the one you see at the back. Uh, this is an image from Yashwan Pitkar's wonderful exhibition called Urban Clutter. Uh, and Yashwan Pitkar was also one of the architects who worked for Chandrakan Patel, but I think several years before I did. Uh, the reason why this image is important is neither the buildings in the front nor the one at the back, but really the, you know, the, uh, the barriers which we see uh, all around the city. We'll come back to that. But I have to tell you that working in uh, this office for about four years, I think, was a wonderful experience, but it did carry forward pretty much the similar notions that we learned in school. What was very important was working in this area, because this was a very dense, densely packed kind of space right in the middle. Here is a building that is emerging out of the denseness of Dalal Street, where fore and aft buildings are already there. They have been there since the turn of the century. And you have this slim tower kind of which emerges from there. Uh, it was quite a piece of work, I have to tell you. As far as I'm concerned, this is still my favorite skyscraper in Bombay. Uh, its, its curves are absolutely stunning. And the way that these curves work in a sense encompass vast areas of the city within uh, the curves itself. Uh, we're very lucky to work on the topmost floor, the 26th floor. So you can imagine the kind of vistas we had at that time. Amazing views. You know, I, I do remember that one of the great pleasures was seeing the monsoon come in slowly over, you know, almost in slow motion. And, and, and uh, uh, kind of cover us completely. Uh, this building is also important to me, very much so, because that's where I met my wife. And Smita was also working there as an architect uh, with Chandrakan Patel. Uh, this idea of the curve is something I will, I will uh, return to once again. But uh, like I said, that this, this was the notion, you know, modernism having these beautiful forms, unusual kind of shapes and spaces. Uh, one of the things that brought in change sometime later was a lecture which happened here in the Max Miller Bhavan uh, by the uh, Italian architect Renzo Piano. And it was a wonderfully attended lecture. And what struck me at that time and has continued to stay with me uh, was a definition of architecture which he gave. Now, I, I don't know how this is with other professionals, but architects cannot talk about architecture. They, they don't know how to, if you ask an architect what an architect, architecture is, is very difficult to answer. But Renzo Piano gave us an answer, and in one sense has stuck with me right from that point onwards. This is what he said. Okay, he said, architecture is art contaminated by life. Okay, and this, is short and profound uh, in a way that kind of brings in everything into the field. Uh, we as architects have never considered ourselves to be specialists. We always look at ourselves as generalists. One of the reasons is because our canvas encompasses everything. It's contaminated by life, okay, whatever you do. So, this meant that you would never design architecture in the sense of ars gratia artis. There is no such thing as art, art for art's sake. Architecture always is related with its context, its habitation, 
its location, probably even its time. And that then helped me because pretty soon I became a full time academic uh, to kind of teach uh, students of architecture. And when one did that, we always kept that kind of point of view uh, in mind that you are not only playing on paper, okay, you are not playing merely with abstract notions, even abstract notions of construction, but ultimately you have to look forward to the fact that there will be an occupant and that occupant, the user, the citizen is probably going to be there much longer than you will be. So you need to take care of uh, all, the, all the requirements and all the necessities for whom you are designing. So this is a very important kind of idea and this brought about a few notions about the nature of the student of architecture which I would just like to briefly talk about. Uh, and these are ideas we did use when uh, I was in a position to be part of the uh, redesign of the syllabus of architecture in the University of Bombay, which uh, is now kind of in its eighth year. We had about two or three batches already graduated from that. And uh, the, in the idea of the architecture student as a the architect and the teacher all together was that all of them and the student too are all producers of knowledge. So when we talk about practice, essentially practice is the production of knowledge and one makes knowledge through practice. Even a student of architecture in doing what design the student does in the studio is in fact bringing to the world fresh knowledge. And of course, the more connected the student is to the world outside, probably the more relevant that, that fresh knowledge is. So that is a, 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 partic a particularly important notion. And in a sense that my kind of idea of what I'm presenting to you, this very diverse kind of uh, ways of looking at things and practicing things, is also this perpetual creation of knowledge through practice. Now this is something I suppose any creative person does do, but one may extend it to say this is what every person does and can be appreciated uh, for uh, uh, on, its, on its own terms. The second uh, notion of architecture is that it is in a sense a meta discipline. Okay, in the sense it, dif it differs from say engineering, which deals with certain concrete kind of terms, but architecture is always a layer that is superimposed on that. You know, and to a very large extent, you talk about talking about architecture. Okay, so it's not just a practice that, okay, you know, I have a building to build, can you build it for me? It's not that way, it is that the architect has to take the notion of what he or she is doing and contextualize it in the past and the present and kind of bring all these ideas uh, together. And the third interesting idea was the notion that, and this is a fairly contemporary idea and it tells you how it differs from the time that we were students and what is happening today, is that today architecture is informed to a very, very large extent by disciplines outside of architecture. When we studied in this kind of modernist cocoon, it was fairly incestuous because architecture talked about architecture. You know, the, you had the terms, you had the jargon, you had the, the references, you had the precedents and you stayed within the same kind of framework. But today that framework has been very clearly broken and right from the early 80s, architects have started looking at other disciplines to understand architecture which is a very interesting thing because uh, what happens is that why would say one look at sociology, why would one look at semiotics, why would one look at philosophy, why would one look at critical theory uh, to inform architecture? Because strangely it has been seen that in most of these other disciplines, they may talk about very many things, but when they give examples, they tend to verge towards 
the spatial, the built, the notion of dwelling. So, the examples which are given and this is what architects found that it is the examples that could inform you. And today we find that the sphere of architecture has become much richer because we are opened out to so many other disciplines. Being a generalist has its value and one of the things it does it keeps you open to <coughs> influences from everywhere. And so of course, one very important notion for me as a teacher is the fact that a student being a producer of knowledge has to be taken as a certain uh, you know a certain benchmark in the schools and it is not only about somebody who goes there to learn. The architecture school is the space where the future can be tried out and the best schools actually do that. Architectural practice on the other hand is rooted pretty much in the present. The architecture school does not need to be and I have always liked this quotation by the architect Daniel Liebeskind where he says, it is time we remembered that schools were set up to challenge the wisdom of the world and its corruption rather than to reinforce it. So, the notion that you have to go beyond what you see uh, in the world outside by creating alternatives, by producing new knowledge is a very, very uh, important kind of thing. In my case, I being located in the Sir J. J. College of Architecture, I had a very interesting resource from which new knowledge could be produced and that was the archives of the school itself. Uh, over the last now almost 15 years, I have been able to kind of consolidate a lot of the archives and put it in place. Uh, one of the first things you learn about is of course, the history of the school itself. It is a school which is now 160 years old and has an in a, a very interesting kind of historical past. Uh, here too, one tends to see that there are things that could have happened there are things that did happen, there are things that did not happen. Uh, everyone knows that it is in this campus that say Rudyard Kipling was born. Okay, there is a building which says Rudyard Kipling was born here. What is interesting is coming to know that he was not born there. And that brings in more interesting kinds of stories. But uh, I would just like to kind of uh, read one thing and that is about a building in the school of architect uh, in the school of art which was adjacent to the school of art. Uh, it is in this drawing you can see this very surreal kind of building. This is a kiln because this was set up to kind of uh, deal with the vast amount of ceramics and pottery that was being produced by the school of art at that time. Uh, the interesting thing about this kiln was that it was never built. What you are seeing is just a drawing. Uh, for me, it is interesting to speculate of what impact it would have had, had it in fact been built. Because through its several, maybe a hundred chimneys, you would probably have seen colored smoke coming over the horizon which would probably have been seen from great distances and uh, of course, the great production would have happened. So, I, I kind of use this notion to write a prose poem in my uh, book of poems and I would just like to read two parts of that. Uh, this is called the great kiln. Like an upended udder whose bovine nipples squirt smoke instead of milk into the skies across Mumba Devi. A hydra mouthed surahi, an ear misinterpreted from written instructions put out by the Ray Arts workshop. A torso shaped by fire brick, deflated by gravity, its resultant the shapelessness of an odalisk portrayed too soon after childbirth. A belch born of fires in the stomach it, rep it remains an acknowledged embarrassment, unpretty but functional. 
function it seems is the great driver of the upcoming aesthetic. It is the new age of utilitarian exploration whose inherency is called to be tweezed out and laid bare for edification and profit. The ceramics master holds himself as precedent, progenitor of a school soon to subsume the salon into a retail boutique. More is more. Unlike the burning of hay and dung, the school smokes reliably, a Havana cigar exhaled in perpetuity by night and by day. Such is the influx of business that Wonderland perpetuates. Wonderland is the name of the pottery that was emerging from the school at that time and was popular all around the Commonwealth. Just one damn order after another. Upstairs, beyond the large windows, the painter's class silently curses heat that has leached the Bombay humidity. Oils crack even as they are slapped on canvas. Marble, freshly supplied from Naples, loses sheen to toxic caresses of co cobalt carbonate that fixes the glaze, to opacifiers like zirconium oxide that give human-sized urns their cabaret bulge, so prized by turn of the century aristocracy. Like I said that it is a school which allowed me to not only create the archives but also play with it as almost as if it is something that belonged to me. Uh, the archives of the school of architecture essentially consists of old drawings, old books, old prints, old journals and I have been able to over a period of time uh, put these together in different ways, especially in the form of exhibitions, uh, so that I could kind of share with the city at large uh, these uh, various forms uh, of, of expression. But one of the things we realized over a period of time, and this I have to give full credit both to the college as well as to my students is that one could not only display the archives, but one could also add to the archives. And one of the ways in which that was done in this particular example is an exhibition that we uh, held a few years back, which was on the art deco facades of the uh, buildings along the oval. Uh, this exhibition called deco on the oval was uh, held in our college and it was well appreciated, quite popular. Uh, most, please remember that most of the buildings in the Art Deco areas of Bombay are still inhabited, some almost 80 years down the line. And they have, uh, they have owners who love their buildings, deeply, are deeply protective about it. And of course, some owners who don't realize what they are living in. But we had uh, most of the inhabitants of the Oval Maidan buildings come visit this uh, exhibition and uh, kind of appreciate uh, what, uh, what we had done. The drawings that we made were something like this, where you could see a building and its various details. There you can see the, uh, the, the compound wall, which is also very ornately done, a kind of art deco work and greater details like there's a building called Moonlight where this is the entrance and this is what it, it, it kind of looks like. Uh, what we saw in this particular case is that in the case of Art Deco specifically, the building facade communicates. It, it has a role beyond simply being an enclosure. Because of the ornateness of its front, because of the manner in which it touches the, touches the road because of the manner in which you can easily access it, because of the manner in which say the upper floor balconies actually cantilever out over your head, it imposes itself into the city and it embraces the city both at the same time. And this is a very, very special kind of uh, architectural location, very likely unique to our city, okay? Because the one thing is there that there is so much of architecture from this period 
which is essentially the 1930s and 40s, uh, where you find an vast swathes of the city being redesigned into these new precincts and all of which involve themselves with the life in the city simply by the manner in which they are built and the manner in which they project themselves. <coughs> this notion of the facade as a communicator is also something that I kind of did my doctoral research on, but that is of course another story by itself. Essentially what I would like to say is that when you are out in the streets, you have to look at the way in which the buildings abut the streets. Okay. Just go next door, look at the building which now houses Zara okay. and you will see that it is there right on the street. Every aspect of the building is right on the street. Okay. Even these little uh, compound walls for these buildings at the Oval Maidan are so low that they do not really obstruct the views and you remember I showed you the image of the, the, the first image where you had these big partitions which are being created all over the city. This is the future in a sense. We are moving towards a certain gatedness which is subdividing our city into smaller and smaller kind of parcels and alienating the inside from the outside which the buildings from the the, the 30s and 40s just did not do. Uh, please remember also that these are buildings that did not really have any great difference between class. Okay. They are built all over the city. There are people from the middle class, the lower middle class, the very, very wealthy all living in similar types of buildings, none of which are saying, okay, you stay away from me. Okay. And, and this is I think an important uh, notion what is the future of our past? In a sense, the future is that you should be able to learn from what has already happened. Uh, once somebody asked me the uh, 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 question about you know why we see so many buildings in Bombay that are curved. Okay. And I answered that with a small piece that I would like to uh, read to you which directly relates to what I have been talking about uh, right now. This is a piece called Well Mannered Architecture and it was written in 2012 and I was ruminating on whether architecture can have good manners. Can architecture have good manners? The impetus for this piece came from a discussion with a friend researching the social mores of the inner city. Why are some buildings curved, she asked. The answer, my friend, is because they are well mannered. Curved buildings are evidence that there is a town planning authority at work. When plots were laid out, the corners of streets always turned a quarter circle, never a right angle to accommodate the turning radius for cars. Buildings on such plots swept along two roads with a curved front. Enforced initially by building regulations, this resulted in harmonies along streets. Walking along some of these streets is a delight even today. Good manners are something you expect and anticipate. There is a special charm to a curved building that matches your urban perception, a comforting notion that things are as they should be. A corner building also gets the privilege of being iconic. It can be seen from three sides, unlike the next in line which has to be content with just one. They locate places in your memory. You describe them while giving directions. These buildings can surprise and delight when encountered for the first time. Take Hornby view on Gunbo street, this one with its shorter semicircular and sharply bisecting uh, facade. Its rousing art deco features emphasize the corner while the inviting doorway leads straight into ideal restaurant, home of Dhandar Patya. We have many such urban delights. Uh, the Suna Mahal on Marine Drive has streamlined curves and is one of G.B. Mahatre's one of the great architects of the art deco era. 
one of GB Matre is best. And further down the road, you have uh, the Eros with its curved turreted marquee end providing a very satisfying full stop at the end of the street. Curved buildings also have a functional advantage when it comes to security. Jane Jacobs says, a building on a street equipped to handle strangers and to ensure the safety of both residents and strangers must be oriented towards the street. She prescribes the notion of eyes on the street belonging to those who live there. Very typically, a curved building with windows on three sides allows for better surveillance, keeping the immediate surroundings safe as there is no blind side. Ironically, Mumbai's curved geometries are evidence of its past, not its present. Its built etiquette withered with time and died an unlamented death in the 70s with the introduction of FSI. Rectangular buildings were designed on corner plots and curved buildings were designed on rectangular plots, an expression of originality by the architects. Today, when the worldly ambition is to squeeze out the last inch of FSI or lay on as much extra TDR as can be mustered, good manners and architecture are not the first nor the last thing that comes to mind. The looking at the, the spaces around us, looking at the streets that we walk, these are things that we kind of started to appreciate even without having to join architecture just that you know that these are the streets that have a certain character. Everyone knows about the covered arcades in Bombay, whether they are the ones on Horniman Circle or the ones along DN Road. They hold a special place in our kind of, uh, or they are embedded in our subconscious because you know that you don't tend to see these things elsewhere. The notion of being able to walk for great distances under a covered uh, kind of uh, canopy, especially given our tropical harshness, is a very, very special thing. And you are all aware that nobody designs things like that now. Okay. So here are lessons that are ready-made and are there all, are all around us that one can actually uh, learn from. Another uh, exhibition, and this one was uh, very clearly of the resources of the school itself uh, was on the Vadas of Maharashtra. Uh, during the 1940s, the school conducted several study trips all along the Bombay Presidency, documenting, measuring and drawing different buildings, especially the slightly bigger ones. And the school has a great collection of drawings of Vadas. Uh, these vadas, and we did tend to find that when we were doing the exhibition, many of these vadas do not exist anymore. Many of these vadas probably have gone even unphotographed. So probably the drawings which we have may be the last, uh, you know, documentation of uh, these particular spaces. But why I show it to you is for another reason. It is because the manner in which they were done. This brings us to the present, to the notions that we carry quite dearly now, especially about conservation. Uh, during that time, uh, conservation was not very big in, in, the, in the minds of the people and even the architects who were there at that time. But the students of architecture were made to do a very special exercise. And that was, in say a drawing like this, you can see that the drawings are in two colors. There is one part of the building which is in black and one part of the building which is in red. The black part of the building was the building as surveyed in the sense that this is all that there was. Only the black portions were there. But the students were encouraged based on their drawings to complete the building. And that they did by using the color red. So when you are looking at these drawings now, in a sense, you get a sense of the complete picture. This is how the buildings were in that time. This is an important thing because, and 
very interestingly, they also had a name for a drawing like this. They call these restoration drawings. And that is the word we use today, isn't it, when we talk about conserving buildings, when we talk about putting buildings back to shape. The notion of restoration is uh, a notion that is, is, is very important, very significant. And I, I mean, we have wonderful conservation architects amongst us, but nevertheless, this notion that parts of buildings kind of wither away, but they can be speculated in a, in a fairly educated way to see what the entire building is like is very, very important. We used a little bit of that even while doing the art deco buildings, the drawings which I showed you earlier, because here interestingly the restoration meant that you would have to see the building without their top floors. In Bombay, what seems to have happened over a period of 50 years is that almost every building has an additional floor on its terrace, okay? uh, unlike the last 15 years, but that is the way things happen. So most of the art deco buildings have to be imagined as one floor less. Okay? And you can very clearly see the difference. So when we did the drawings, we kind of removed that one floor to see what buildings look like. This is doing the reverse. This is saying, okay, these are the ruins we have, but now can we speculate uh, the, the building in its completion? We will need to do that in different parts of our city. Uh, two buildings which come immediately to mind, one is the Watson's Hotel, okay? And every monsoon we kind of hope against hope and pray that it stays up. But many parts of the Watson's Hotel have withered away. If they have to be kind of, if the building is to be restored, then a lot of speculation will be needed to reimagine the parts which have gone. The other one is the building right opposite Metro, Jar Mahal. Okay? One of the great housing kind of buildings in Bombay, but the, the front facade has almost got clean by all the wooden parts having collapsed over a period of time. One would hope that in buildings, in, in, in spaces like this, you don't have FSI and TDR making its role, but the building itself can be restored and, uh, and generated. Another exhibition which we uh, did based on some other parts of our archive gave us a very interesting sense of architectural education and in a sense fed back into the history of Bombay. Uh, we call that exhibition the past as present because in that exhibition we looked at different streams of learning that were happening simultaneously in the school, especially in the, from the late 1930s onwards. The students in a very schizophrenic kind of curriculum had to learn to deal with architecture that was both old and new. Okay? So very interestingly, they would be asked to do something like this. This is a design a student made in 1946. It said design of a seaside shelter in the classical style, which meant that a student had to use a style from the past to design a building of the present. Okay, you could have, I mean, you can imagine this, design a hospital in the Mughal style, okay, or design a library in the Gothic style. Remember that by this time the whole revivalist thing had almost reached its end, but in the school these were, these were called special history kind of classes. You know, a student had to be able to be do, to, to be, uh, to, to kind of understand proportioning systems to understand ornament, to understand detail and so on. But at the same time, they were also designing buildings like this. Okay? And as you can see, this building is as modern as it gets. So both these skills were being imparted to the students. Very typically, they also learnt by copying, which is typical of an art school, okay? where you have a drawing and then you just copy it to try and see whether you can do that to, to a great extent. Uh, they also learnt ornamentation by copying and so on. So we find this very interesting chain of 
uh, of, of architectural practice, which takes us from the late 19th century revivalist kind of period, where you had neoclassical buildings and you had neo-Gothic buildings, later on even Indo-Sarsenic buildings, and moves slowly away from that into what we now call Art Deco. And then after independence would move into a much more clear modernist uh, kind of uh, phase. And what we have seen on the streets and appreciated on the streets gets contextualized when you actually see the build, the drawings which are done by the students uh, of the architecture school at that time. Being one of the very, very few architecture schools in the country, most of the students who graduated from the Sir JJ school then set up their architectural practices, uh, not only in Bombay but probably in different parts uh, of the country and then did their various kind of practices. So, this became a very interesting way in which I could involve myself partly as a curator, partly as a researcher, partly as a historian to bring in a certain knowledge about the city that was pretty much just hidden in shelves in the school. And this is again a production of new knowledge. Uh, that becomes part of the urban practice uh, that, that I am privileged to do. One other uh, wonderful event for urban practice for me was collaborating uh, with the architect Kamu Ayer in the uh, doing some research on this great architect called G. B. Mahatre, who was uh, who, who did several buildings which we now consider as classic art deco buildings uh, in Bombay, uh, which include buildings like Suna Mahal, which I showed you, but also many of the buildings on the, on the oval, such as Empress Court, uh, several buildings on uh, Firosha Mehta Road, and in fact, all over the city. Uh, looking at the, the architecture there, a lot of these notions of good manners actually emerged from there, the, the understanding of that. So, uh, that was a kind of special way of consolidating uh, knowledge which then led to my own uh, doctoral research and also the exhibition which I, uh, which I showed you. Uh, these are also things which are in a sense slowly going. I do not know if you are aware, but you know we do not, we talk about our art deco buildings as buildings on the oval or buildings on marine drive, but in fact they are all over the city. And probably the largest, largest group of art deco buildings is in, in the Dadar Matunga area, where you have the Parsi colony and the Hindu colony and all that. And uh, Kamu Ayer himself stayed in probably one of the finest buildings designed by G. B. Matre called Goldfinch. And this photograph, this, this flooring you see is the flooring in his home. Uh, just a week back, there was this beautiful exhibition on flooring by Bharat Tiles. I do not know if any of you saw that. Uh, it was in Chatterjee and Lal, which uh, talked about the evolution of cement and the evolution of tiling in the city. Very likely, this is also from Bharat Tiles. Uh, that is not the point. The point is Goldfinch does not exist anymore. Okay. The, the kind of pressures of real estate have ensured that the building itself has been taken down under this rubric of redevelopment okay, and has now been rebuilt. Uh, that street where the building Goldfinch existed is a very interesting street historically, because historically this is in Matunga. Uh, one street next to the VJTI uh, called RP Masani Road. But in its time, this street had another name. It was called Hollywood Lane. Because interestingly, a lot of the Hindi film stars used to stay there. Okay. At one time, the Kapoors lived there. Uh, Madan Puri, K. L. Sagal, all these people lived in that street, which was lined on both sides with Art Deco buildings. Okay. Today, a large part of those buildings are gone or going. What does that do? It changes the scale of the street completely. You can imagine what happens when a 
ground plus 3 building is replaced by a ground plus 22 building on the same place. Okay. And this kind of changes many, many things. It not only brings in a new kind of uh, factor of architectural space of urban kind of scale, but in most cases it also brings in a certain type of gentrification. Okay. It, it changes the people, the, the, the groups of people who live there. Many of the people who live there originally do tend to move out, new people come in. Uh, the streets which were quiet, dominated or rather you know enhanced by full shade giving trees on both sides now have to handle multiple cars. And you have seen these new buildings which come up in the city, have not you, where you first find 10 floors of parking before you even find the first floor for habitation. This is the way in which uh, things are, uh, are, are changing too. This idea of you know taking something which is which has a certain scale at an urban level and replacing something which is scale less at an architectural level and superimposing one on the other is again a bit of a problem. One of the places where we do tend to see this is in this new areas of the city where there is a new notion of building which is called cluster design or cluster building. Cluster building basically means that you take several buildings at once, okay, consolidate them into a single plot, demolish the lot of them and then rebuild on top of that with all the new norms which are there at your disposal. Uh, one of the most important cluster design projects in the city is of course the Bhindi Bazaar project. Uh, Bhindi Bazaar project is very significant because it is held up as a role model for the future by all concerned by the people who are building it as well as the government who tends to look at this as something that they can encourage other places in the city to do. But what does it do to the place that was okay, uh, is, is something that is interesting. Uh, a piece I had written some time back about this uh, particular project, I have put it through a kind of personal kind of gaze because just as you know radio uh, cinema and radio hotel and Crawford market were places where I would generally be you know walking around as a child, Bhindi Bazaar was not too far away from there as well. Bhindi Bazaar also for Bora households is very, very significant. Uh, so here is the piece. Ever since I remember a commonly heard refrain in many households is that I am going to the Mohalla. The Mohalla is Bhindi Bazaar. This throbbing heart of Bora culture in Mumbai is the place to congregate, socialize, conduct small business, pass time, gorge on cups of street side chana batata. The Mohalla is also for ziyarat or offering prayers at the Rosa Tahera, the mausoleum where the present Sayyidna's grandfather is laid to rest. And of course, if it is Friday, it must be Chor Bazaar, the Friday only market on the adjacent Mutton Street where one can be equal parts flaneur and haggler. Urban culture in Mumbai is very real. It is also intangible and thrives on two assumptions. First, that an urban place in the city can be taken for granted and second, to paraphrase Robert Frost, when they, when you have to go there, they have to take you in. It is anchored around a very few and on occasion nondescript physical markers. A left turn here, a shop sign there, a street vendor at the corner. Urban culture is also thus very fragile. This is true for Bhendi Bazaar. It is also true for Chira Bazaar, Satrasta, Sivri, Parel or any of the other nine locations where cluster redevelopment is scheduled to happen. 
This clustered vision disregards the intangible, but very real patterns of urban life. Mumbai is Mumbai because the rich and the poor have always lived as hamsaya, with homes facing the same street, because the diversity of economic class and religious affiliation has meant nothing, especially in the densest neighborhoods. Because though there are ghettos, especially in the inner cities, there are no walled exclusions. Because the desire to come together to create an urban place is the result of social accretion over years, very real even if you can't put a finger on it. Mumbai is Mumbai not only because of urban homogeneity, but because of social diversity. To presume this the other way round, like cluster redevelopment projects do, is to deny and choke the very spirit of the city. Look at the new Bhindi Bazaar. This is what we see. A private future built on 16 acres of South Bombay, imagined by the wealthiest of a Mumbai sub-community in its own image. We see pristine homes of rest and quiet, secluded from the rest of the dirty city, your city, by walls or buildings that function as walls. I would like to show you an image of the project and this is a very early drawing of the Bhindi Bazaar project. What is very interesting, this is from one of their early brochures. You know what is very interesting in this, if you can spot it. No, that is not what I meant. Where is the rest of the city? Okay. Everything you see is green. Right? It is as if the city does not exist. This is a building, uh, this is a project which seems to have been conveyed entirely in isolation of the city at large. Right outside, very next to it is the densest part of Bombay. Some consider these areas in Bombay the densest part anywhere in the world and in the middle of that denseness you are taking these various acres and imagining a entire Elysian kind of future, you know. We see pristine homes of rest and quiet secluded from the rest of the dirty city, your city, by walls or buildings that function as walls. Access to these redesigned acres will now be through gateways that never existed before. We see skyscrapers rising 60 stories abutting the same narrow street on which the older four story structures still exist. As a matter of fact, this long street here is Mutton Street, otherwise known as Chor Bazaar. So, what you would find when this building is ready and it will be ready, I can assure you, is that on the same street, on one side will be a four story fairly decrepit building. Across the street will be a 60 story building and that street is perhaps 10 meters in width, okay. it is probably between just about half of this room. So, you can understand how scales will tend to change. Yeah. We see several buildings demolished to make way for a large park with an unobstructed frontage along the mausoleum. Where did the Mohalla go? Can the same social fabric that held together for a century remain in this upmarket utopia? Can small businesses thrive without their formal, former durable networks? Will Chor Bazaar retain any identity when one edge of Mutton Street transforms into a barricade? Who speaks for Mumbai in these new projects? We accept the rights of the individuals as supreme in a capitalist present. No one denies that better housing, amenities and facilities should be paramount for all. But should we at the same time not define responsibilities for the same individual, uh, the same way that the individual has towards the city at large? Is there no quid pro quo? And I ended this with a, 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 a 
line from Fez, but I changed it in my own way, which was that wo intezar tha jiska, ye wo shahar to nahi. The notion of or what, what has been most important to me in the city uh, are two notions, both of which in a sense have come under some amount of pressure. One is the notion of inclusivity, okay, the fact that the city belongs to everyone and inclusivity is seen uh, in, in this piece which I read, the, the notion of how inclusivity will become a problem in a project such as the Bhindi Bazaar project. The other notion is that of the public real. Once again, that is an inclusive space. Inclusivity in Bhindi Bazaar may be a place to live, but the road outside of Kitab Khana is a road that should be inclusive because it is part of the public real, because it is a part where everyone should have equal access to and not be mediated in any sort of way. So, these became uh, quite important points for me when it came to uh, appreciating the way our city is, is, is constantly changing. The other important point which became a very important uh, kind of notion was the manner in which the buildings which are coming up in our city react to their immediate surroundings. And in this case, I mean something fairly mundane, but very, very significant and that is the fact that we are in a tropical location. Okay? The, the city of Bombay is in the tropics, it has a particular kind of climate, it has a particular kind of environment and a set of seasons, which one tends to find more and more uh, buildings do not tend to uh, appreciate. We on the other hand are looking towards creating an almost global kind of building typology which should be able to fit anywhere. Uh, you know in the early modernism that I was talking about when we were in school, uh, there was this notion called the international style. We do not talk about it too much nowadays, but at that time the international style meant that the architecture was so universal that the same building could be built anywhere in any part of the world. And this was made possible particularly because of new materials and new technology, because of the use of cement and steel, you know, and such uh, different innovations. Uh, the problem in a post global kind of scenario which we see ever since we have had our liberalization and our economy has kind of opened up is one tends we are leaning back to that again. Okay. And the large number of projects that come into the city are all projects which are almost global in the way that they are conceived and executed. Uh, some years back we had a seminar here on tall buildings. There is an international association of tall buildings uh, if you do not know and once they had their seminar in, in Bombay and a lot of architects from all over the world came and presented their ideas and their new projects and so on. What we found most interestingly was as we went as teachers, you know academics, but that place was thriving with contractors, okay, with, with vendors, with, with, with the people who provide services. It was full because and, and they were all local obviously, they were attending that because Bombay is the place where you can get the state of the art when it comes to building. Okay. What you cannot get is something I would like to read about uh, in, in, in the next uh, little piece, which is the value for the space other than its monetary kind of uh, association. <coughs> Do you remember this? Yeah, uh, this was a photograph that was circulated quite uh, quite a bit on the internet in around 2010-2011, and I wrote a piece called the Blue Tarpaulin, 
I will read some parts of it. In my opinion, the Ambani and uh, okay, I have to this context is also there. You know, when Antilla first came up for a very long time, about two, three years, the family did not move in. Yeah, you remember that? So, in my opinion, the Ambani family did not shift into their two billion dollar abode because of a vastu dysfunction. I think the problem was much more mundane. Antilla leaks. <laughs> this is why Mumbai was subjected to the rather unedifying sight last monsoon of large parts of the world's costliest urban home covered with a blue tarpaulin. Antilla apart, the blue tarpaulin is a sight that has become ubiquitous all over the city. Normally associated with slums in mid-growth or buildings under construction, Antilla caught our eye mainly because it was a skyscraper, a state-of-the-art Uber house, one designed by a wanted outsourced foreign architectural firm. Let us begin with the moral of the story first. Mumbai's climate will bite you on the bum if you do not respect it in the first place. The tarpaulin is indexical of the essential disjunction between our aspirations and the sensitivity we have to fulfill them. The buildings in our city rise higher than ever. Hundred stories and more are now being commonly contemplated. The appreciation that they are being erected in a top, tropical climate seem to be bypassed by the day. Sleek, blister-packed glass edifices routinely puncture our skies, forming beacons shanghaied by visions of an uncharted future. In the tropics, any architecture whose predominant feature is a wall exists in denial of the hot summer, the wet monsoon, and year-long humidity. Its four millimeter glass exterior is the only pro protection against these insistent forces, and a window pane is a very meager insulation indeed. Whereas this knowledge is self-evident, even your grandmother would tell you uh, that it was, the exigencies to ignore it are too strong to resist. Technology and real estate prices beguile both designers and their patrons to potentially problematic buildings. There are locations in Mumbai now that go for up to rupees 700 per square inch. So the need to maximize saleable area commonly overrides common sense. The choice of steel frame technology is increasingly replacing reinforced cement concrete for two reasons. The first is that the building erection is prefabricated, dry and speedy. Secondly, a steel structure itself occupies the least space in a building and therefore encloses so much more square feet that can of course be monetized. So like a tetra pack of milk left out in the sun too long, the building bulges from the inside out, straining at the seams, appearing at first glance that all is well from the inside. Uh, this has been an essential problem and, and there is no overcoming it because the newer buildings that you see are so dependent on monetizing the floor space uh, that we now even see some strange uh, things like having no overhead water tanks because even that takes up a space where a floor could exist, right? So you have water which is being pumped all the time and you can imagine how that works when you have immensely multi-story kind, of, uh, kind of buildings. Yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll just do that. What I'll do is, uh, I thought I might just end by returning to the idea of poetry uh, by reading a couple of poems out to you. And a very interesting connect between architecture and poetry uh, that I saw was <clears throat> in this very lovely quotation by uh, Gaston Bachelard where he says that we are never real historians but always near poets. And our emotion is perhaps nothing but an expression of poetry that was lost. From time to time, and this is not something that I have done all the time, 
architecture and my other practice does inform the poetry, but that is just from time to time. Uh, what is special for me is also to look at the translation that I do and of particular interest in the translations that I have uh, done of the poet Heman Divte from the Marathi. His, his poems are very interesting because they are completely contemporary, they are located right in the present and they accept the kind of strangeness and the kind of imperfect world that is all around us. Uh, and within that, his, his poems resonate very, very strongly. So, if you will indulge me, I would read one short poem and one slightly longer poem. The short one is a translation uh, from Heman Divte uh, and the longer one is one of my own. Uh, this is a poem from uh, a, a book of translations called Struggles with Imagined Gods. Uh, this is a poem called Male Address. I reach into the innards of a Pentium 4 processor and log on. Chat with a friend beyond the seven seas. He knows of my former life, of the riots in Malegao, of the Shiv's, Shiv Sena's Dasera rally. Of all, the prize, of all the prizes Asha Bhosle has won and so on. I know how his wife was hurt yesterday. His son ran his tricycle over the little toe of her left leg. How his yellow shirt got burnt while ironing it. How his son misses my own whom he met just last month. I informed him that I did nothing special this Dasera, that my blood pressure is okay and so on. Last night, a lot of loud noises were heard from our neighbor D'Souza's flat. This morning, his front door opened with a bang. But being civil and all, I did not know just how to ask D'Souza what happened. I had not run in, into him for several days now and I do not even know his email ID. This poem also kind of uh, deals with the sense of change of flux in the city uh, and uh, this is one I have written, it is a prose poem. It is called The Last Pair of Kolhapuri Chappals in the Known Universe and to help you, here is an image. <coughs> it is important because look at all the parts. Uh, this poem is also located in Nagpada, uh, which is an area just maybe a hundred meters away from Bhindi Bazar. Also very, very dense kind of area, but there is a lot of change happening. The last pair of Kolhapuri chappals in the known universe. On the turning of Dimtimkar street into Timkar Mohalla, a mobile repair store flourishes. Every new customer while praising the proprietor's acumen on an odor almost sublimated, almost passed off as a whiff of imagination. For 47 years, Mamdu chopped meat with the finesse of a mobile repairman on a trunk of shisham inherited from his father along with meat cleavers and a sharpening strop. For 47 years, the trunk steadfast like granite stood right there in a shop where SIM cards are now arrayed. Mamdu sits on the stoop across the street, finding in the eyes of every punter a former customer of trotters, kidneys or testicles. Once in a while, he plays tunes in his head, chop, 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 backbeats he once composed while reducing muscle to mince. Twice a day, every day, he tweaks his skull cap, puts down his lungi for modesty and airs a grilled vest as he enters Iqbal restaurant, the pride of Nagpada. He is granted moong dal and rice, 
a largesse that bleeds him internally as he swirls scraps of gourd in his bowl. The owner of the Iqbal eyes him cursorily, satisfied that Mamdu still walks on something promised to him for the two square meals. The soul may have worn down, but the leather work remains burnished. Angtha and Karangali are wound into exquisite veinies, like the braided knee length tresses of Tamil heroines in old Hindi films. The Kapshi Patta across the foot is adorned with a dye punched floret, topped off with a fluffy gonda, red as a cherry on a black forest cake. Each stitch identifies the mochi who made it. Mamdu is aware that he is being inspected as he rises to wash his hands. Under the tap, he opens out his gnarled palms. Digits rise like crags in the de Deccan traps, metamorphic remnants of the furnace of eruption, denuded of all vegetation. In contrast, the soles of his feet are as soft as a, he as a healthy liver, protected port and starboard by side flaps of leather. He turns his back on the longing gaze and walks to resume his vigil on the stoop. Mid-street, he is accosted by a posse of cattle whom no one has the goatees to claim ownership. Like a believer, he touches the rump of the one nearest. His fingers meet bone instead of loin. It sears his soul to let them scavenge detritus on Dim Timker Street, chewing plastic instead of cud. As the malnourished horde moves on, he recites a Fatiha under his breath. He no longer visits the Sangetras Mosque on Hujara Street, not even a hundred yards away. His promise has made him a heathen. Owner of the last pair of Kolapuri chappals in the known universe, Mamdu has set down his twinkling knives, conceding defeat to a vegetarian city. He burned this bridge himself, handing over keys and location to a boy whose skills lie in shuffling printed circuits. In the years he has left, he looks back at the times he made it out alive in 1969, in 1984, in 1992, and again in 1993, using his bulk and his blades to intimidate his way out of conflict, flying rather than fighting, letting his trusty Kolhapuri snatch him out of harm's way, even as successful, uh, successively in 1969, 1984, 1992 and 1993, they burnt his shop down. For nearly a year after, every passerby salivated unself-consciously, assailed by the almost sublimated, almost imaginary whiff of burnt meat. Well, thank you. You can Google it, you will find it. It is the first thing which comes. Very yeah, yeah. It is the, the first thing on Google. Any questions at all? Good evening. I'm a, please sit, please sit. I'm a Parikh. It was so nice to listen to you. I'm sorry I was late because of the development work of Metro. Roads are dark up and there was traffic now. I, be, I go to Ahmedabad uh, often. There we have BV Doshi, those buildings which IIM and others, no matter how hot summer it is, if one walks, if one is inside, one doesn't feel the heat. Unfortunately, in Bombay, the weather being what it is, I do not find any buildings, the high court where I practice and city civil court, which are made of stone. There it is cool, rather cool inside. But most of the buildings are absolutely functional, just made to accommodate people. 
when one walks down the road on Thompson, those architectural style of the buildings, JJ School, and this Western buildings, and this uh, down the road, those so, uh, wiki. So the is question, question is this yeah. architectural style which we had to see others. Nowadays, we don't find it among the builders. Yeah. So that is my first question. And, and the second question I wanted to ask you is, with the surge in the population and the metro plans and all, and what is the scenario going to be of the future? Well, like I read out in my piece on the, please sit, on, on, on the tarpaulin, essentially because you want to make money out of every square inch of space, you want to create the edges of the buildings that are as thin as possible. So what is the ideal way to do that? Is to make buildings with glass facades. And that is the answer to your question. When you make a building with glass facades, it has its own consequences. Correct. You, you, you cannot insulate the building as well as say, a stone building does. Okay. You cannot protect it against the rains as well as older buildings did. And these are the consequences of that. As far as the metro is concerned, I think the, we need to wait. We need to see what will happen. Because the most important thing about the metro is it is public transport. And one would assume that in public transport, you would have thousands of people who are transported through the public transport than would be by the sale of cars. So whether the metros will improve our situation in the city and bring in public transport in a large way, I think we need to kind of just wait and see what happens. So, but whenever fires take place, that's a different. Object, large fire uh, you're, you're talking about something entirely different. Mustan sir, uh, yeah. when we were chatting before uh, yeah. this session, you had mentioned how uh, how in a lot of countries, in a lot of other countries, there has been an understanding of how to take care of your heritage in terms of buildings and how people are thinking about it. Could you talk to us a little bit about, uh, you know? Sure. Uh, see, we've, in Bombay especially, from the early 90s, we've had a fairly good heritage movement. And a lot of good architects and then a lot of trained conservation architects have come together. Fortunately, the state also kind of got its act together at the right time. And there have been, there is a heritage list. There are buildings which have been identified, listed, and conserved. What has happened since the 90s, now how many, 30 years down the line, is there is one set of buildings which seems to have been fairly well conserved. And you can see, you, you know which are the important examples and so on. Uh, but those are mainly the iconic, the monumental, even the colonial kind of buildings. In this process, we see two types of things which have not been really addressed, uh, not well addressed at all. One is that buildings which come after that. It is as if, say, a building which is 80 years old has no value, but a building which is 85 years old has a lot of value. So there is a certain arbitrariness in the way you know, the attention is paid to a certain kind of building. Buildings which are built in RCC, which start coming up from the 1920s onwards, today are the ones which require most attention. And that is not really happening. Equally much, these same buildings are freely demolishable. So of course, we tend to find that buildings which we would have put down as modern heritage, so to speak, are going faster than we can stop them from being broken down. This is one. The other problem which we have, which, we, which happens in other parts of the world, not in ours, is that you don't, you don't conserve a building. You conserve a precinct. In other parts of the world, where say an area with similar types of building are there, or there is a similar cultural typology, or a similar, uh, you know, various cultural aspects, social aspects, you have to look at them together and conserve it as a single thing. That is something we have almost completely failed in looking at, say, a precinct for conservation. Which we have failed at, let me say. We have not been able to imagine it as a precinct. We are imagining, we are preserving single buildings, but we are not looking at it together.
Hello. Uh, you talked about the fact that Mumbai is a gated city or is becoming a gated city. We are all aware of the fact that it's a very speedy type of life that we lead here. And I would like to address the poet. Um, does, does the poet manage uh, to um, slow down the pace of the city? Because you say in one of your poems that uh, poetry cannot save the people, but uh, words can be like bird lime, which is such, a, is such a beautiful image. But does the poet manage to uh, slow down the pace of the city or not? How does one answer that? <laughs> if, if enough if enough citizens read poetry, perhaps. <laughs> Thank you. So, correcting you are that question of 1920s building, which were demolished or not. The same has happened in Metro in Girgaon and Kalwa Devi. That's right. At Girgaon, at junction of uh, Thakudwar, there was building built in 1916 all that uh, Chandra Mahal and all, they are all demolished. And now there is going to come 55 stories Mahada True. approved build uh, tower, yeah. one this. And again at the junction of uh, Princess Street, where that Agyari is there, opposite Little, near the Kalbadevi station, where Girgao, Kalbadevi center for business is going to come of 50 stories. So how much the traffic, this and that, that metro load, will take over, it's a question mark. Absolutely. And second is this coastal road where only 1% of the traffic for the car owners will live and they're going to acquire, uh, reclaim 170 acres. Work has already started because of Supreme Court judgment, which is being misused at Priya Darshani Park and up to Bridge Candy. Just to so how this will solve the, no, if we wait for Metro to solve the traffic problem, I think I have my question, uh, doubts. And, so just a clear now, See, I, uh, one of the ways we have to look at it is that, you know, our city is very uniquely shaped. It is a peninsular kind of shape, okay. We have no option but to wait for things to happen. If we had a different shape of a city, then there would be different ways in which one could network it. Here you just have, you know, up, down, left, right. So I think the best thing to do is to wait and one should hope that public transport will eventually make a difference to our city. And this will be the last question. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, Mustan sir, thank you in the first place for a really rich and inspiring presentation. But I had a specific question for you. If I understood you correctly, did you characterize modernist architecture in India or modernist architectural education in India as being inward looking for a long time? And that architecture was its only referent a very quick question, because that's not, as of course you well know, that's not, that wasn't modernist practice anywhere else in the world, where architecture was completely embedded in dialogue with the other arts, with scientific changes, thinking of just the Bauhaus as one example. Do you think that that has much more to do with the nature of technical education in India? The disciplines, scientific and technical disciplines only look inward? Uh, yeah, but not only that. You are absolutely right that the scientific disciplines are there. It's also the nature of practice. It is a manner in which the profession rose in the city. Uh, I, I assume that the profession rose in imitation of, say, the RIBA, you know, the Royal Institute of British Architects. As professionals, uh, it was pretty much a clique. Okay. The, the other uh, notion is that almost everyone who populated that profession were all emerging from the same school. You know, so it was a homeboys kind of uh, a, a set of professionals. So the, the parameters that they set for themselves as professional codes of conduct pretty much limited the manner in which one would uh, look at what was being done and what was not. That is why you find so much of the same. I think, you know, it's, it's just a matter of peer uh, kind of uh, give and take that leads to a type of building. Maybe that is also the reason why we have so much of Art Deco, okay, because the professional, see, uh, one thing which you should all know is that Art Deco in Bombay is almost completely homegrown. It is all designed by architects who studied in Bombay itself, 
okay it's not art deco is not a foreign architect kind of you know british architecture it's not that way it's bombay's architects who were who were uh, designing the buildings and so much of it but one of the things was that right from the early 30s there was the indian institute of architects and then there were the profession which had its own like i said code of conduct so i think both reasons are probably important one is the technology and the science behind it as well as the uh, the the nature of the profession and the the interaction of architects with art seems to have been of an earlier generation the generation of lockwood kipling you know who brought in a lot of the uh, ornamentation on the neo gothic buildings but from the 40s onwards it seems to have been architects speaking to architects one last question yeah I just want to push the discussion into the 19th century because you referred to it. You talked of, I don't know whether I'm correct, but I think you said that the Vadas and the Vadis uh, had an element of the inclusive culture in them. Is it true? Is yes. that what you said? Okay. Yes. What sort of evidence would you cite in defense of this? Uh, in the sense that uh, within probably the same community, you would have people from all the class levels inhabiting the vada what is you the know. evidence the is there any statistical information to support uh, this no this is this is just anecdotal okay. just that uh, could there be statistical evidence I, yeah. i don't know i'm sure there is yeah i mean i'm sure but but my knowledge is more anecdotal than anything else. you think this is true i think so i think i think we've had a you know we've had a long history of rich and poor living side by side in the city uh yes but not in the same way as uh, i mean surely it very tension filled lives living together true but if you look at just one step outside the vada is the public realm which was occupied by everybody in a sense what i'm trying to say is that we don't seem to have these kind of rich pockets of the city you know to that extent it's, it's all much more diffuse much more mixed yeah we, we we never really had even in the 19th century a black quarter that way you know yeah but uh, well this this maybe this question can be discussed a bit sure. later on yeah and just just one point look at the locations of the houses of jagannath shankar shet jamshed ji 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 bhai you know these yeah. the, the so called city fathers they are right there in the inner city areas isn't it so what about Sounding off topic. Did you ever interact with Foy Nissen and his no, document? No. Not at all. I, I am uh, afraid. There's an no. ongoing exhibition. It, it is. I know that, and it's an exhibition. I would encourage everyone That's, to see. That's. Uh, I would like yeah. you to just uh, yeah. mention that. Yeah. It's ongoing. So I'm going to close this what session. Uh, you can talk to him later because the uh, we have to close. Kitab Khan has to close. So thank you very, very, thank very, very much, Mustafa, for a fabulous, thank fascinating thank talk. Thank